All right, welcome back. We're still celebrating International Youth Day. And we're going to switch the conversation now slightly to um, social justice. And of course, we're talking about access, basically, for young people in Nigeria. And uh, in the last week, um, the National Bureau of Statistics brought out a, a report uh, detailed about unemployment in Nigeria. And it's pretty depressing, for want of a better word, uh, where Nigeria currently is. Um, I think the exact figures are about 21.8 million Nigerians are unemployed. Forget about the unemployable parts, <laughs> which is also very scary. Uh, basically, out of a hundred and I think 160 million Nigerians who are of working age, um, just about 50 million of them are working. And um, th that's that's is a very very scary statistic. Uh, the unemployment rate has fallen even further now to twenty seven point one percent of the population, and I think that's uh, anybody who sees that should know that's a ticking time bomb. Well, I have you with me, um, Father Daniel. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How thank you. did you receive this? Uh, how worried should we be? We need to be very worried, and that's because we initially had a very poor system to first of all get accurate data. I'm not sure how the National Bureau of Statistics comes up with the data because I think that there are quite a number of people who are not essentially captured in the data. Do you how, think it's even worse? I, it could be worse, and I believe it is worse, actually. So how did they capture the number of people who are not working, the number of people who are working, seeing that we don't have a national identity card or we don't have a data collection system that can prove on a monthly basis, I lost my jobs, I have gotten a new job, or I'm about to lose my job and stuff like that. Generally, the pandemic has made it worse all over the world. So we may actually have that as a soft landing because the pandemic was unprepared for. But even before the pandemic struck, we knew that we had a terrible situation on our hands. And one of the challenges that we're having is because we keep sending money abroad. We keep sending money from the governance abroad. We keep sending money from corporations abroad. I was listening to something on television some days back, and the man said, we import virtually everything that is importable. We hardly produce. And if we're not importing, it's going to be difficult to create the number of jobs that we should be creating. During the pandemic, I wrote a piece which was an open letter to the president. And one of the things I mentioned in my series was that we need to support the local manufacturing plants that we have in the country. Imagine, for example, I don't know the owner of Innocent and I have nothing to do with him, but imagine if we supported his company by making sure that there is an assembly plant in each geopolitical zone of Nigeria with 5,000 workers in each plant, a minimum. Imagine the number of people we're going to have in all the geopolitical zones. Now we've, getting, we've gotten over 20 billion as donation during the pandemic in order to make sure that the COVID-19 cases are reduced in Nigeria. Imagine if we had spent 2 billion naira on one general hospital or a federal medical center across the geopolitical zones to make sure that we upgraded them. We're going to need somebody to maintain those facilities. We're going to need some technicians to keep them in order, to, to operate them when their need arises. So, well, how, 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 Sorry to cut you there, because I, I, I get your point and I see where you're going. But uh, we hear a lot from this government about the fact that this rot didn't just start today. A lot of these things are a backlog of sort of... Um, in their words, in action. I understand that, but there are some. We, we need to take, as I say, take the bull by the on. For example, till date, we still spend over 150 billion naira on the National Assembly. For what exactly? And our budgets do not actually reflect that we're preparing a new budget on a yearly basis. One of the things we're doing is just to take the budget as a template from the previous year, tweak a few things here and there, and represent it. Because you look at the budget year in, year out, you realize that the purchase of computers always recall. Why are we buying computers every year? So if, if we're doing that, we're going to keep saying, look, the problem started years ago. The money is there, even though we don't have a lot of it or we seem not to have a lot of it. But the money is there and we can turn things around. But if we're not hard on ourselves, we don't, cost, we don't cut the waste in governance, we're not going to make the turn around. Isn't it fair, though, like you said, I mean, you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. the pandemic. Isn't that a fair um, analysis of why things are this bad? Around the world, I mean, we saw this, the numbers in America mm -hmm. go crazy from about 3 million unemployed to over 20 million at some point in the United States. The case of the America The country is has been shut down yeah. for this long, and we don't have a, a robust enough economy like even America does. Okay, look at the figures. Over 20 million people don't have a job. Now, that's 10% of the entire population of the country. 200 million. 
That's minus the people who are able to work and those who are not able to work. So let's say 150 million. In fact, let's say 100 million are able to work. So when you have 20 million who are not working out of about 100 million who can actually work, that's almost... That's over 20% of your population not working. It's, it's terrible in Nigeria. The pandemic would only give us a soft landing for this year. Before the pandemic, it has always been worse because we're not creating the jobs. Everything we want to do, take for example, the metering process that we're doing in Nigeria, it's foreign companies that are being given the contracts. Take, take a look at the constructions that we're doing all across the states. It's foreign companies that are actually doing, even though they claim that they're using Nigerians to do them. But the question is, where is the money going? Uh, we're joined now by Fisayo Shoyombo uh, via Skype, and I, I just want to get to him now. Fisayo, um, you, the, the COVID conversation, I don't know if you think it's a valid enough reason for why uh, the, the unemployment numbers which were released during the week are as bad as they are. Thank you for having me. I I don't think this has anything to do with COVID. Before COVID, Nigeria's unemployment figures were, were always soaring. Um, in the last two years, it's been really bad. So if we didn't have COVID, I don't think um, I don't think anything would have changed, really. Yeah. I mean, you do, you do very well with investigative journalism. Um, what, what is really going on? Uh, we've seen a constant decline, especially in the last, I want to believe, six years or so with regards to the unemployment figures in Nigeria. What is really the root cause of this? What is going on is that the, the the government is there's a lot of propaganda going on into anything the government says. Um, the things we are seeing are not the exact pictures. The jobs are not there. Where where the jobs are there, the jobs are are, are exaggerated. The figures are exaggerated. Um, even where the figures are not exaggerated, the jobs are not getting to the people who need them. You know, you saw what happened recently with the screening uh, and festus Kiamu at some point I had to say that the lawmakers wanted to take over the process. And that's typically what, what happens. People who need jobs don't get the jobs. The figures that are being put in the media are not exactly what they are. And at the end of the day, when you have an independent agency like the NBS come up with figures, the, the truth is always going to come out. You can't you can't panic beat you can't panic beat the truth forever, no matter how how hard you try. When the chips are down, it's going to be clear that we are just um we are just the, the the government is just telling the people what it wants to hear, and and I say this without specific recourse whether it's APC or PDP. It's the way governance has been in this country. It's been about propaganda, rather about um, doing the right thing, and then and then projecting projecting what they are doing to the rest of the country. Yeah, a question for both of you, but let me start with you, Fisayo. I mean, the talk about uh, subsistence farming and agriculture always comes up, and there were statistics saying that uh, when you take away subsistence farming, the figures are even more scary, which is why a lot of the states that topped the charts uh, with unemployment were states that maybe didn't have enough land where farming could be done. Um, do you think, uh, I mean, government has pushed a lot for, for young people to move towards agriculture, whatever level it is. Do you think young people are not doing enough to explore that? When you say government has pushed the people enough, I, I I would disagree. You know, look at all the loan schemes that the government has come up with. How accessible are they to the common man who has no connections in government? You know, how accessible are they? What bribes do they have to get to pay to get these opportunities? What is left after the payment of these bribes? You know? When you do the kind of work I do and you speak with people at the grassroots, people who want to access these opportunities, it becomes clear that in practice, things are not as they seem in, in public. Until we get to a point in this country where um, governance is about the people, where governance is about the public interest, you know, where the the, the low man, the high public can can enjoy government and governance without having to do anything extra. Once you get to that point, it's always going to look like we are doing so much, but we are getting little returns, you know. Um, you have an agency, for instance, to, 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 for me to be pinpoint, you have an agency like Nessar that gives loans and tells people to apply and they pay a certain amount of money, you know, when it's not even clear they are going to get these opportunities and you present it to them, like if you don't pay this, if you don't pay, you are not your your application is not going to be reviewed, you know. So you are rubbing it out to people, and at the end of the day, the opportunities are just not going around. Summary is things are not always in 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 practice, practice the way as they, they seem. 
in theory. It's not a okay. question of people not being able to access the opportunities. It's a question of the opportunities not being fair and transparent enough for the guys who are doing the real work to enjoy them. Do you agree that, I mean, we talk, we hear, we've been here agriculture, <laughs> but I want to believe for the last decade even, not just this government, it's been, oh, young people yeah. need to farm more. Agriculture is capital intensive if you're going to do it successfully. And if you don't have the money, take for example, let's even start with storage. If you actually harvest and you don't have the right storage facilities, the goods are going to perish before you get them to the marketers. We only have the likes of Farm Crowdy and a few other entrepreneurs who are into agriculture who are able to help the young people in Nigeria because they are like off-takers. How many Nigerians actually have off-takers for the products they're going to farm? So that's a problem. The other part where I need to corroborate what he has said is about the application for the loan. I work with people on business consulting, business proposals, business plans, and stuff like that. One of the major challenges is that I think the government is looking forward to people with solid documentation, even if they are not going to be, be able to execute. So sometimes you may have a solid document, you get the loan, but you can't execute. But there's other guy who can execute, doesn't have a solid document, and doesn't get the loan. So there's a problem in that system. The, the modality for selection of the recipients of the loan, we need to revise it. Yeah. Don't just give people money because they're able to put together a solid document because there are so many people who are consulting with other people to get very beautiful documents. The, all the figures are accurate, all the permutations, all the projections are right. The forecast is fantastic. So if the other guy doesn't know who to talk to or a consultant who can help him out, he won't be able to get a solid document, but he has all the experience required to get it. So the problem with agriculture is not that people don't want to be involved, but it's capital intensive and they are not getting the money, partly because they don't have the document. I don't want to use the word angry, but do you think young people are... Not angry enough, but mm. what is it going to take for young people to speak up more? Because this mm. affects young people. And the, 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 it's looking like it's not going to get any better from what you guys are saying. So you can what call do it righteous. You can call it indignation, <laughs> which is righteous anger or something. Now, one of the things we, we would do is to change the kind of people we have in leadership. Because no matter how much we shout, nothing would change if we don't have people who are listening in government. Take, for example, I shouted a lot regarding the stamp duty. I gave analysis. I talked to people. I said, this is why this thing is wrongly timed. This is why we cannot be talking about increased stamp duty or whether it's increased or adjusted. It's just not the time. Between January and June, the government made 66 billion naira from stamp duty alone. And if they continue on that trajectory, they're going to make 132 billion. At a time when the nation was on lockdown, they made 66 billion. Please, how much did they give us in palliatives? For them to be making 66 billion. And I spoke about it, wrote a letter about it, spread it. I was shocked to see that Nigerians weren't even pushing it. So if we have people in government who don't listen, it doesn't matter how much we shout or how loudly we're shouting. Yeah. You can shout from today to tomorrow, nothing will change. But you see, in nations where leaders listen, when you shout, something changes. So what we need to change is the leadership that we have. So, uh, Fisayo, do you agree that um, we're shouting, but the leaders are the ones who are not listening, or is this lazy Nigerian youth <laughs> phrase uh, true? It's a mixture of everything. We are shouting, the leaders, it's not like they're not listening, they're just poking fun at us, you know? No, no, leave them on social media, let them shout for 24 hours, 48 hours, they're going to get tired, they'll move on. And that's what happens. We shout for a while, and then we move on. We need to we need to be persistent. We need to be painstaking. And we don't need to shout only when the stakes are personal. And that's that's my my biggest grievance against the people. We are selfish in our manner of agitation. You know, when it doesn't concern us, we don't bother. We don't bother. If you don't know the, the, the lady who's um, who lost her life because a container fell on top of the car she was in. It's not a problem. But if it happens to us, then we take it up. We need to look at the problems of this country from a holistic perspective. We are all in this mess. And if we, if there aren't people who feel they are immune to um, the problems of our country, then we won't, we won't move forward. Even those who are not currently affected must think that someday they are going to be caught up in it. And then we need to speak with one voice whether it's PDP, whether it's APC, whether we, we, we stand the chance to get a, a political appointment or whether we stand to get a job with any bank, we need to look beyond ourselves and what we start to gain and speak collectively 
for the good of this country. I think that people only speak when it personally concerns them. That time when I write to reason, people say, what's your business? What is your own? Just recently, <laughs> um, I had I had a challenge with the federal elections, and I put out a tweet, and then they, they, they came to, I mean, overbilling over without supplying prepaid meter. And I put up a tweet saying, if you know people who have this challenge, let them come here and let's mobilize. And I wanted to take a class action, you know, against the, 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 the continuation of estimated billing, you know, when we should be giving meters. And guess what happened? People only came to say what how it affected them. No one wanted to mobilize other people. So look, if we are 300,000 people and we talk about how it has affected us, can we get another 900,000 people who are affected but need to know that this is happening? And then we have 1.2 million voices speaking against estimated billing. People just came and spoke about what matter to them and they moved on and that was the death of that idea it died ever before it took off until we get to a point where we are looking at the collective if we continue to focus on the personal we are not going to make any progress whether it's the pdp that is in government or it's the apc it will continue you know the young people have to do things differently have to look beyond ethnic prejudices have to look beyond religion have to look beyond political affiliations and know that it's our turn to build this country. We are not going to play the blame game forever. This is what our forefathers did. This, that's what, no, <laughs> we can't continue. <laughs> because, uh, we are we becoming the forefathers ourselves, we are aren't we? Also going to, right. <laughs> um, before we go now, uh, both of you don't sound very optimistic. Very quickly, what, what does the future look like for you with regards to you know, social justice, youth employment, and just Nigeria going forward? Until we actually... Uh, exhausted or we run out of options, we'll do the little that we can. Now, one of the reasons agitations will not excel in this country is because sometimes, for example, when I appear on television or on radio and I talk about some of these things and I'm very frank and very straightforward about the issues, I have my own family members who will call me and say, ah, don't talk like that. Oh, these people are wicked. Oh, they are, you know, that kind of a thing. But I, I, I'll tell you, I used to tell people not to leave this country, but now I tell them, if you can find your way, please Google your way out. I, I've become that, I'm not pessimistic yet, but I just see that it's going to take a while for these things to turn around. And I hope that it doesn't take too long or people's lives and destinies don't continue to be wasted. Until then, young people, young Nigerians, do whatever you can. If you can't do anything, please feel free. Use the borders. I wasn't the note I was expecting to end this, but <laughs> I guess we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for that, Daniel. My pleasure. And of course, Visayo Shiombo for joining us uh, online. We're going to take a break now and continue the conversation. Please don't go away. <laughs>